So, I give you these commands so that you may love one another. You know, we do live in contentious times, don't we? And certainly the disciples did too. Everything that Jesus was talking about, we have this backdrop of contentious times. People struggling uh, to have their voice heard and struggling on all kinds of levels. And it's, it, it was a difficult thing. It's difficult now, to be sure. It seems to me like people are set in their ways uniquely and have rather little desire to have a conversation with someone who represents the other side. We struggle sometimes to communicate. It creates a challenging context for the church, to be sure. Because these fractured times are not what God had in mind. Now Jesus offers his disciples a pathway to connect with each other and the world. But to be able to do that, we have to start by seeing all people as sacred. It's ground zero for we have to get into that space. And certainly over the last few weeks, uh, Jesus is preparing his disciples to do ministry after he dies. Just to recount some of the things that were going on in the upper room, the table talk, as we were on the table talk too. He gave them a commandment uh, to love each other. He explained to his disciples that you will in fact do greater things than I. He gives his disciples the power of the Holy Spirit to guide them, to keep them, to remind them of what they are to do. He shares with them his peace, the actual peace that comes from Jesus. And he says to his disciples, recognizing that what he's asking them to do is not easy, but he does say this, I give you my peace. I leave it with you. Do not be troubled. Do not be afraid. He goes forward and he talks about the fact that this ministry of peace is not easy and that we have to be aware of our own selves. We have to be aware of our community. And there are times when we need to prune a little bit. Maybe some attitudes, some ideas, some frustrations, but there are, could be a need to prune so that we can share God's love more freely if we harbor disgust and, and all this other stuff for the others it is very hard to do. So to prune away whatever those distractions might be. And then he talks about the importance of abiding in Jesus and Jesus in you to in a, to um, um, imagine that Jesus is with you, that you are a child of God, you are sacred, Jesus is with you, and you are with Jesus. In today's lesson, he underscores the fact that if we keep the Father's commandments, we will abide in his love. So keeping commandments, the commandments we are aware of, is evidence of abiding in God's love. Therefore, if we do not keep those commandments, it's evidence that apparently we're not abiding in God's love. Now this gets interesting. Uh, the question might be asked, will we or won't we abide in God's love? Do we abide in God's love? Is whatever we say or do a reflection of God's love for humanity? It's a question. Another question is, what do we put before God? Do we place God in a, a kind of a convenient place to use as we care to, to justify other positions we take in life? 
Or do we let God carry the day? There may be other things we put before God. It could be the nation of the United States. It's before God. Or equal to God. It's not. It could be our political affiliations. It could be just about anything we can take and put before God and, 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 and just let our lives be controlled by other voices and other things that absolutely do not in any way resemble the peace. It's amazing how we can get swept away. And so, we go back to that upper room and we hear that it's necessary for us to love our neighbor as ourselves. We keep recycling back through this, to love your neighbor as yourself. The neighbor is always everyone. It's not just the guy or gal next door, right? It's the whole of God's world. That's the neighbor, anyone outside of myself, is my neighbor. And sometimes, in this contentious world in which we live, and it's not the first time in our history that we have seen contentiousness. I think back to a time when there was a thing called the Civil War. That was pretty contentious. But what does happen is in this contentious world, we separate people, we divide people, we put people in categories, we judge people as wrong if they are not agreeing with me. We diminish what? the understanding oh, no. that God is There's another commandment I want to be bringing up, particularly this year. It's a commandment that says, do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Don't lie about your neighbor. Don't do that. When you do that, you are killing me. I tell you the truth. It goes on everywhere in our society. It's more acceptable. You know, I used to think in my days of studying political science that you had to be careful what you said about someone else because there are laws, slander laws, libel laws. I don't even hear this stuff being talked about enough today. The context of God's world that we live in right now is, in fact, fractured. It creates challenges and opportunities to capture the understanding of God's love and to share it with all people. This is not easy. And bearing false witness uh, makes it almost impossible. In our culture, that too often is put before the great shalom. We see evidence of this type of contentiousness when we place it in a win-at-all-costs motif. I will do anything to win. No matter what it takes, I will win. I will deny the value of the other. I will deny the sanctity of all life because I must win at all costs. It happens everywhere. It's a problem. We divide each other and we don't allow God's love to reign true. 
Jesus is trying at that table of grace to help us be whole with each other and to take that message out into the world. I was at a retreat uh, Sunday through Wednesday at uh, St. Augustine's house in Oxford. And uh, one of the things we do is we go to chapel. You can go like eight times a day to chant the Psalms. And uh, I didn't go eight times, but I went like four times a day. And anyway, at the Eucharist, uh, there was the, the, the prayers that we would do before our communion. There was this, you know, the, the prayers that we do. And there was an opportunity for people who were there to share their own prayers. Now, uh, this one guy who was a monk, he started to pray about all people who are working through the issue of life. The giving birth of the child and the hopes and dreams of the family and the fears associated with that. And also the fears and the pain and the heartache of others who may be choosing a different route. And he was able to unpack the pain and suffering that surrounds the whole thing, not judging, but praying for people's peace. I had never heard such a prayer. It was pretty amazing. And uh, I left chapel with my friend, uh, uh, another pastor, and we went and sat down, we were talking about things, and we were talking about that prayer, and we were all reflecting on these lessons from the upper room. And after that, we said, you know, the whole thing in this contentious world is that we need to really promote unity, the ability to see the other. And it is part of the way we fulfill the great commandment by attempting to develop this idea of unity, that we are all united. Not to listen to those who would want to divide us, but to actually see, no, we are all God's children. We are uniquely made. How do we come together? And listen, I will tell you, if we look for unity, we have to learn to listen. Listening is a great gift. It's the greatest gift we can give anyone, is the ability to listen to the other, to hear their story, to ask questions, to become engaged, to allow the individual to share their existence, to affirm their life, no matter who they are or what they might believe. It's possible. It's one of the ways that we can operationalize the hope of Jesus. My friends, in contentious times, we must, we must swim against the tide and we must feel like we are. We must feel like we are swimming against the tide. And as we do, we might find common ground. We're looking for that common ground. As we swim, we're looking for that island of common ground. That's the ground that Jesus would say bears fruit. If we want to just unpack it all, that's the ground that bears fruit. And as we think about common ground, we think about common good. Common good. You know, the early church, that was the big mantra, common good. 
How do we share what we have? How do we affirm the other? How do we grow in our faith? Unity. The fuel we need to establish unity is the peace to operationalize the great shalom in every single thing we do. That's what fuels this unity. I have appointed you to go and bear fruit that will last so that the Father will give you anything you ask in my name. And so we ask the Father to help us. And if I'm having a hard time uh, uh, forgiving someone, Father, help me to do it. But the way that we see the fruit, the way that we see the fruit can be seen in a blessing that I share with you every other week. It's called a Franciscan blessing. It was written in 1985 for a student group that was led by Sister Ruth Marlene Fox. It's a blessing for, for fruitfulness and peace. May God bless us with discomfort at easy answers and half-truths so that we may live deep within our hearts, not someone else's. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, exploitation of people, so that we may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless us with tears, tears, to shed for those who suffer from pain and rejection, starvation and war, so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them and to turn that pain that is very real into joy. And may God bless us with enough hope to believe that through Christ we can make a difference in the world. He has given us the opportunity to hear and to see and to understand God's greatest hope, to become fruitful. And we can do this, folks, and we can do it because he is risen. He is risen Amen. Amen.